Hey, welcome back. So in this episode, I'm going to show you how you can recreate this ability using Unreal Engine's gameplay ability system. Okay, so the first thing I did was add new entries to our ability ID enum, ability one through five, in case we want to have multiple abilities. Okay, and then I bounded ability five to key M. So if you go to your project settings, input, you have to create action mappings for each one of your entries here. That way you can automatically like bind these abilities to whatever keys you want. So I did ability five to M, confirm to left mouse click. That way when I hit play, if I press M, it starts the ability. And if I press left click, it'll confirm to cast the ability. Basically how this works is in our player character, we call this function here, bind ability activation to input component. And this essentially uh, will associate this enum that we made. See, this is the same name as over here. Um, and try to like find all of the input mappings in your input settings. And basically like find the ones that match the name, uh, not not display name, this doesn't matter. The uh, The actual like, name of the, uh, the entry here and basically yeah just bind those keys to those abilities and then of course confirm and cancel our special ones and that's how the, the keys get mapped okay so now onward onto the actual gameplay ability so if you look here the the parent class is the character gameplay ability class and it just has stuff similar to the gameplay effect class. Um, so like which tags actually get applied when you cast the ability or when the ability is active, uh, which, which tags are required to be on your character, which ones are blocked, etc., etc. Um, some special ones are the cooldown gameplay effect class and the cost gameplay effect class. Before we look at those actually, let's just open up the character gameplay ability and I just want to show you that it's pretty much the same as a regular gameplay ability, except here is where we actually keep track of which ability IDs is associated with uh, with it. Okay, and you see here this this basically just tries activating the ability if we have this checked, and prevents us from activating the ability if we're dead or stunned. But um, it's important because when we actually call this function here that adds the character abilities to uh, our character, we pass in the character's uh, actual ability input ID here. And that is what actually maps the ability input ID to the input action mapping that we created earlier. So as you can see here is where we actually set the ability input ID to ability five in our meteor class here. And that's what finally binds the key M that we set in our project settings to this ability here. See, ability five, M, ability five. So the cost gameplay effect is literally just a gameplay effect that modifies your attribute set in some way. So in this case, the meter cost gameplay effect just reduces your mana by 20, okay? And then when you pass this gameplay effect into uh, well, into the, the cost gameplay effect class uh, variable here, it'll try to apply the gameplay effect. And if you have enough of that resource, then it'll actually let you cast the ability. So say I have zero mana and I try to remove 20. If my resulting mana would be less than zero, it won't let you cast the spell. So see here, if I if I call the commit ability function, it'll return a Boolean. True means that you're actually able to cast the spell uh, because you had enough mana or whatever resource you want. And it'll return false if you didn't have enough. And this other one, the cooldown gameplay effect class is also very simple. And it's literally just a gameplay effect that has a duration and a tag like this, cooldown.skill.ability5. And basically, 
the game playability class just knows that if you have this tag on you, then you won't be able to cast this spell. All right, so for the actual functionality of the game playability class, you have to first override the activate ability um, event callback, and then we get the character who casts the spell. We're going to basically get the starting camera boon location and add the offset to the Z axis and finally update the camera location. Okay. This is what gives us the, uh, the effect of like the camera zooming out whenever we want to start aiming. Okay. And then if you're wondering how we actually show the, the little like area of effect indicator, we, we have to first get like the target location info from owner actor. We break it down and basically add our forward vector to it. That way we start by spawning the indicator right in front of our character. Okay, and then we call this special function called wait target data. And this will basically spawn in a gameplay ability target actor, which is that indicator that you saw. And it you might pass in other variables here. Um, for example, the this specific one takes in a max range, so you can't actually aim super far. Okay, we also pass in a trace profile to indicate like, how it should like get traced on the ground. And finally, we just pass in the start location. And yeah, that's basically what spawns in our reticle here. So I'll hit M and you'll see the camera zooms out. And there we go. That's, that's what uh, the weight target ability Weight target data function does. Now before we move on, let's just quickly look at what this meter target actor actually is. So let's open it up. The parent class is just the gameplay ability target actor ground trace. Basically it just has logic on how it should get like traced on the ground and stuff. And all we have on it is a decal of this target uh, targeting circle. So let's open this up and you'll see it's literally just this texture uh, and we color it blue. So pretty simple. And yeah, that's that's how we get that little targeting indicator. Note that you can also make this indicator whatever you want. You can even have a static mesh here. So let's make a cube. <laughs> sure. Uh, we'll keep that here and we just have to disable. We have to disable collisions on it. And look, if I press M, you'll see here, <laughs> it shows that mesh that I was talking about. And once you commit the ability, the, the ability target actor disappears, as you saw. All right, so now that we've spawned in our ability indicator and the user confirms where they want to target their, their ability, we get the, the target data, we commit the ability, Right. If we didn't have enough resources, then we're going to cancel it. Finally, we're going to ensure that the, the player has authority. Uh, in other words, you know, it's, it's a server and it can actually like cast the ability on the server. And if you're not the server, then just end the ability. And if you are, it's going to basically create a gameplay effect spec for the damage effect. And we're going to make one for the stun gameplay effect and then we're going to pass those into here because as you can see all this is doing is actually spawning that meteor that you saw so cbp meteor we pass in the spawn location by getting the target data right then you're going to break it up get the location add some height to it so the meter spawns above that spot and yeah, you're going to pass in the damage and stun effect spec handles. And finally, we're going to end the ability. Also note that when we call commit ability, we're actually subtracting the resource and starting the cooldown. But anyway, let's now look at this class here, the BP meteor. This is what actually gets uh, created when you commit the ability. So as you can see here, it's very simple. It's just a sphere collider with a projectile movement component. And this is what drives it 
uh, downward, essentially. So you can have like the, the meteor mesh or whatever you want on it and it would just come down. One thing to note though is this specific ability um, came with an emitter. Here, let me try to find it. Basically, the meteor effect, particle effect, where is it? I think it might be this one. It actually spawns in the meteor and does that whole thing. So instead of actually having a meteor in here and making it move down, I just spawn that specific emitter at the top and tried to mimic the motion of that like main meteor with this uh, sphere collider and this projectile movement. Okay. So first off, when we first spawn in the meteor, we're going to set a timer for three seconds to just destroy the ability after three seconds. Uh, so if we just look at this destroy function, so they're just saying destroy actor and I'm just printing here destroyed just for debugging purposes. And then finally we spawn in these three particle emitters. So this one is the like the actual like meteor. This one here is the portal. And this one is like those little comets coming down. All right, so if I'll play it, you'll see what I'm talking about. See, those are like the comets and the portal and the actual meteor. Now, for the actual logic here, we wait for an overlap event on that sphere that's moving down. We try to find collisions with any of these three things. And if we detect one, we're going to loop through each one of them then ensure that each one of them is an actual character and that that character has an ability system component, right? So once we make sure that the character has an ability system component, we're gonna apply the damage effect and the stun effect that we passed in from here, remember? Now, one thing to note too is if you don't want the abilities to affect the actor who spawned them in, you would just basically check to make sure that the instigator of this ability is not equal to the person who got hit, right? And if that's also true, then yeah, you apply the damage and do whatever. All right, so if I'll compile, run that again, I'll just show that the ability no longer affects me. But if I remove this, the ability can in fact damage and stun me as you see here. And those purple particles are just the indic the gameplay cues for the stun effect. All right, well, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. Honestly, there's not much else to it. If you were wondering how I actually got the ability, you would just pass in the ability to our characters, um, abilities array here. So yeah, I just passed that in as a known ability and yeah, if you're wondering how I did the stun, it's pretty straightforward. So it just has a duration of four seconds. It applies this tag, see? And basically in our actual player character, when we check if is alive, we also check if the uh, ability system component has the stun tag. And if, and basically if we don't have the stun tag, then that means we can move and look around. But if we are stunned, if we have the stun tag, then you can't. And similarly, uh, since we made like the gameplay character ability, like parent class here, we always just add this to all of our new abilities. That way you can't cast anything when you're stunned. Finally, for the actual little stun particle effect here, we kind of covered this in the last episode, but it's a very simple, I just made this simple like emitter component and then created a game gameplay queue stun. See, just that. And see, it's gameplay queue notify actor, parent class. And yeah, that's pretty much it.
See here, I indicated the gameplay queue here. And yeah, you should have everything you need to recreate this ability. This is the first time I'm doing videos like this where I create the actual thing first and then explain how I did it instead of actually walking you through step by step, line by line of code of how it actually works. So please let me know if you enjoy this format better. Leave a like, subscribe, and comment what kind of tutorials you'd like to see next. Thanks.